Hi everyone, um, I'm Cynthia Moore, and like Sabal said, I work at Google. I'm a manager on the UI and the Google VR team, and I lead the education and creativity efforts. Um, I'm super excited to be here and be able to share with you some of the amazing things I've got to learn in the past four years while designing products for education at Google. So, how did I get into education? I've been working in the tech industry for a long time, like 13 years now. And when I started at Google in 2011, I decided that if I was going to work in education, oh, sorry, working technology, I wanted to work on something where technology can truly make a difference in people's lives. And as we know, you know, technology has been, you know, changing how we live. Here's an example um, of St. Peter's Square in 2005, as Pope John Paul was laid to rest. Eight years later. St. Peter's Square, as Pope Francis was announced in 2013. You can tell the difference of how technology has changed our lives. The classrooms have really, you know, not changed much in the past 75 years. If you look at these two pictures, there's hardly, you know, anything different, right? And that's a shame. Technology has done a lot for many different industries, but really not, not, we haven't done enough to change how we learn or how we teach. So let's go to today. I want to share an example of what we can do with technology to improve uh, the way we learn and we teach. When we started working on education at Google, we spent months observing teachers and students and classrooms. And one of the key themes that emerged was that doing very simple things was so hard. So for example, uh, creating an assignment took forever. Put yourself in the shoes of Jamie here. He's a teacher, and what he has to do on a daily basis, multiple times a day, is that he has to create the materials for his lesson, print it, go to the copy machine, make copies for all the students, hand them to all the students, collect them from the students, take all the papers home, grade them, go back, hand them again. That's like insane. It has not changed in decades, right? Like, how is that possible? Um, Here's another example that hit home very, very, very badly. This is a, an example of a teacher trying to explain second graders how to use Google Drive. It was very clear <laughs> when we went to this classroom and we saw it, we were like, oh my god, this is clear, it's not working. Wow. We need to make something different. So this is an, uh, how we got to create Google Classroom. Um, I was very fortunate to be part of the team who created this product. And what we focused on um, was to help teachers save time so they can focus on teaching rather than doing all these tedious tasks, right? As an example, this is a screenshot from an internal one because we don't want to, you know, sh uh, show people's names. But here, as an example, teachers can create an assignment, uh, they can upload any document that they want, and they can say, with one click, make a copy for all the students. So what that means is that in the background, we're basically creating a copy, a digital copy for all the students in the class, append their name, first name, last name, organize it on Google Drive automatically for the teacher and for the students so they don't have to do any of those tedious tasks that I just told you about. So that's, th those are the kind of things that we were able to accomplish by really um, just paying attention, observing, going to classes, looking at what they were doing, how they were spending their time. And also, they were, we worked with a few schools here in New York that uh, piloted our very early prototypes. They were so great at that, and they gave us a lot of feedback. And that's how we got to launch this product, because when we were you know, with these early prototypes, what we thought we were going to um, uh, launch, you know, with their feedback, we made it better. We made it way better, because it was more relevant to what, they were, what their, their needs were. So. Um, Teachers are, you know, like this, this product became the number one learning management system in the US shortly, like a few months after we launched because of that, because we focused on users and what their needs are. Um, and you know, like teachers, teachers are really a tough crowd. They're on stage like I am right now, uh, every single day, every single lesson, they're basically on stage in front of like 20 or 30 kids or more. And you know, when they're gonna use technology, it needs to work flawlessly. Otherwise, they're not gonna take the risk. Like if something looks a little risky, they're not gonna go for it. But at the same time, they're very open to trying new things because they do care and they wanna improve how students are learning. And this is a huge opportunity. And it's this opportunity that led us to create Google Expeditions. And this was a year later after we launched Classroom and in 2015. At Google, we, we started our VR efforts with cardboard. Very simple, accessible, 
cheap, right? So when we saw carbon, we're like, oh my God, we need to do something with this on education. And we wanted to create something that, you know, was very easy and it would be like an effective use of VR at the scale to millions of people. So it's very simple. It's you have a piece of cardboard, you have phones, which is very accessible, and then uh, we created this app so you can take students on virtual field trips and you can take a group of students so it becomes a more uh, social um, experience. And it's working. Every day tens of thousands of kids are using VR to learn with expeditions and they're really excited about it. Oh, come on. This excited. Uh, so this is it, you know, a kid uh, in a classroom in Mexico after going on an expedition and it's just like... I that's so awesome so I think while well, classroom Google classroom addresses very real pain points that existed for decades expedition is looking at ways to transform how, how students learn now I bet you if you ask most people to list things um, they think VR will be good at learning is going to be on that list so I'm not really questioned whether this is obvious but really why is why this is important and how can we make this happen after using expeditions for weeks and months, we still get really great feedback from both teachers and students. We get handwritten notes from students and it's like the best thing. We have, have them all, all over like our office walls because that's just the reward. Like that's why we do what we do. So it's not just all novelty of like using VR for the first time. There's something clearly working and today I want to reflect a bit on this and why this is important. Uh, we believe that good VR experiences are immersive, interactive, and social, which are the same things that, you know, characterize good learning experiences. They're immersive uh, because being engaged, motivated, and having an open mind is critical context for learning and actually having fun. They're interactive because it's great to have agency as a user, to not feel constrained, and to be able to, you know, like have a thought and see a result, to try things and dig deeper on, that, on things that pique your interest. And finally, they're social because when people have diverse viewpoints, it generates discussion, and then people learn from each other after they reflect and have open conversations about it. So here are four different observations that we've gathered of how we can use VR um, and for learning. I'll walk you through each one of these with examples. First and foremost, we know that we're not gonna replace a full lesson with VR. That's just not gonna happen today, right? But it's very, but VR is a very effective tool to supplement or augment an existing lesson or materials and activities. And it's, and it's great because at this point, we don't want teachers to throw away everything that they've done to try this technology, right? Like it's just like um, a good way to try it and see how effective it is. Here's an example. This is an amazing lesson that a teacher in the Bronx uh, has been using for over 10 years. She asked the students to imagine their, arch their archeologists that have just come upon the ruins of Machu Picchu. The teacher hands out this like 2D printed pictures of uh, one of the great wonders uh, of the world to engage with the kids' imag imagination. And even if you do a, like an internet search of Machu Picchu, you're mainly gonna get a lot of pictures of people posing with llamas. Now, <laughs> imagine if the moment looked more like this, right? Expedition puts this lesson on steroids. The teacher didn't change any of the lesson, but the students were more able to like literally imagine themselves here and seeing the, ru the ruins themselves. Only we got this by stitching VR scenes together, and with that, they were able to have a more comprehensive understanding of the place. So keep that example in mind for a second, and bear with me, because I'll try to explain why I think this type of VR is, is, uh, is working. Basically, cognitive theory Cognitive Love Theory said uh, that we only have so much mental energy um, to be able to apply for learning new things. Like all of you are probably very low on mental energy right now after a full day of sessions. <laughs> so as an equation, you basically take the total mental energy that you have, um, that you have and then subtract the inherent difficulty of the thing you're trying to understand, that, that concept, and then subtract the effort required to just understand that concept and what you have left is the mental energy to be able to learn something. 
and traditional education environments are almost in design with the goal of maximizing the number of textual and abstract, numerical abstractions required to understand certain problems, which is crazy. So if we return to the earlier example, I'm suggesting that one of the reasons VR immersion works really well is that by replacing these static 2D pictures with this immersive 3D one, students spend less time trying to imagine what Machu Picchu looks like and more time trying to figure out why it looks like that, which is basically the point of the lesson. Um, so let me get, turn to a different example. We see um, lots of um, effective use of expeditions as a tool for providing context and relevance, for making inaccessible places and things seem immediately present and accessible. Here is an example of, um, of a school who took a ferry trip on an expedition to the Kruger National Park in South Africa. The students then had to like, write an assignment where they wrote postcards from their trip to Kruger. Again, this is a lesson the teachers have been using for a long time, and they reported that the students' writing, the students writing was of higher quality. They just had, you know, way more personal perspectives, more vivid descriptions, and they provided way more details than they did before going on an expedition. We've also seen this work really well for a different sort of use case, mainly learning about different careers. So we did this whole set of career expeditions to show kids the ins and outs of different professions, and maybe professions that you know, maybe none, none of us may be able to even see or know about. Um, these expeditions show how professionals, you know, what they do at their jobs, how did, what did they study to get the job, and what, how do they apply that knowledge to their current job. It's a really, it's a great way for students to visualize what it would be like to be, you know, to be working and, and, and um, going for that career. Another example. A teacher took his students on a trip, on an expedition trip, uh, to Ellis Island before actually going to the actual field trip. So it's funny that one of the early criticisms that we got uh, when, uh, when we launched expeditions was that, it was that Google was trying to kill the field trip, which is crazy. We do not want to kill any field trip. I think this, they're awesome. But this is an interesting use case. The teachers were curious to see what those students' reaction would be when they actually go to Ellis Island after going to an expedition, would they be bored? Would they be like, oh, we already saw this, like this is lame, uh, like did we unintentionally killed the field trip? And the answer was an empathetic no. Actually, one of the guides at Ellis Island told us that they've never seen students more excited and informed, and they had, that you know students had a lot of questions, and they actually pointed out times all the times that they misspoke. So it was great, like, you know, like the students were like knowing way more than the guides at that point. So next uh, set of examples. Here is the Hong Song Dong Cave System, one of the biggest in the world. I've never been, but it looks amazing. Students are remarkably unimpressed by looking at this picture because it's just really hard to get a sense of scale. Like they don't know how big this cave is. I mean, we, you can't even tell, right, by looking at this picture. But pointing out a, a human being on this VR scene gives you that sense of scale and immediately makes you, you know, like compare yourself to that person and realize how big and gigantic this cave is. Um, and that's like just it becomes huge and impressive. And the last one, the final category of example, is triggering deeper reflection and empathy. VR is in, indeed impactful and real for this. For example, you'd obviously never be able to take um, a class to an Ebola clinic in Sierra Leone, but it, it's hard for teachers to make this relevant and for students to connect with this narrative and their stories, right? But, but with VR, students can, in, can get more immersed immediately and, can, and get engaged with their stories right away, which was really, really great to see. One of the things that learning science uh, would say is of critical importance is, uh, is about like these reflective moments that students or learners should have referred to as metacognition, where you think about your own process as a learner and what you, what you achieve. So here, like, we have these three takeaways. 
One is that the power of immersion can help people understand, understand abstract things more effectively. Number two is that the physical space that VR creates appears to lead to a better student um, that retaining difficult uh, problems than they do with 2D stuff. It also means that you have to be more thoughtful about how you design these experiences. And we also are continuing doing, to do more research to really understand the lasting effect of this type of experiences in the learning environment. But you know, the early, early returns are pretty exciting. And the last takeaway is that it's a really good sign when students have strong opinions and are thoughtful about them. This sort of experiential learning doesn't work without some reflection to make learning about those experiences concrete. Okay, now I wanna go back to why VR and learning is important. Anybody know this person? Awesome. So this is Seymour Popper. Popper saw computers as a powerful learning tool, not because of the things people thought computers were great at, like doing repetitive tasks and you know be able to compute faster than a human being. He saw the potential to use computers as a way to learn things by creating, by doing things. He created Logo, the first programming language, language for kids, and this drawing robot called a turtle that lets students visualize the results of their programming. I remember this application like clearly when I was in elementary school. It was my favorite class. And the goal was to learn, I, mean, I didn't know this, but the goal was to learn by doing, by making things and trying new things and failing and trying again, and you, you were able to visualize it. I didn't even know it was programming. But here's the great irony. In the past, you know, like 30 years after Papier and many others started to rethink how we can use technology to support learning, what has actually happened is that we've made much more progress in teaching computers how to learn than we have with human beings. Uh, one of the people, <laughs> one of the people that I, I worked closely with at Google, Jonathan Rochelle, he's one of the founders of Google uh, Docs and Sheets, he recently pointed out that we can learn a lot about how to improve human learning from the way we improve machine learning, which I thought was very interesting. 25 years ago, artificial intelligence basically meant encoding computers with as many absurd facts and equations and logical statements as you possibly could basically feed them as many if-then statements as possible. They followed instructions, they did math faster than we could, and they were great at remembering facts. Excelled at repetition. In a way, traditional education tries to give kids artificial intelligence, memorizing all the facts, standardized testing, learn some rules, and pick the right one. Let me explain this with an example. A study in the US uh, in the 90s, ask a group of fifth graders to solve this problem. There are 26 goats and 10 sheep on the boat. How old is the captain of the boat? Anybody know the answer? <laughs> Three quarters of the fifth graders in the study produced a numerical answer, the most common of which was 36. But there were some 16s and an amazingly 260. <laughs> the study quoted one of the students who answered 36. Well, you need to add or subtract or multiply in problems like this, and this one seemed to work best if I add. Now, these kids are not stupid. It's just that sort of, a, of the absurdity of trying to program them like traditional computers. Like, that just doesn't make any sense, right? So then computer scientists made something much more powerful happen. We started to program computers to classify data, to recognize patterns, to predict future states. And in a way, artificial intelligence gave way to machine learning. We moved from making computers that were smart on account of how much, how informed they are by, you know, by all, by all the facts and, and information that people will feed them to computers that were smart because of how good they were at learning. It turns out programming a computer to be smart appears to be much harder than programming a computer to learn to be smart. So artificial intelligence makes computers intelligent by giving them lots of facts and logical statements. Machine learning makes ignorant computers good at learning. So if you give a student some structure and to observe success or progress and let them try and fail and try again, they will become better learners. Here's an example. How many of you remember Deep Blue? How many do you know Joel Benjamin? 
Okay, not that many. <laughs> so Joel Benj Benjamin was a chess grandmaster that the Deep Blue team um, from IBM worked with to encode Deep Blue's uh, game strategy. They basically extracted as many if-then statements from Joel Benjamin and created a powerful computer that would do what Joel Benjamin would, uh, would do. And then there's AlphaGo, the computer that defeated humans in the game Go last year. This wasn't, done, this wasn't done by encoding a computer with everything we as humans know about the game strategy. This was done by programming a computer to learn about how to learn what is the best strategy uh, for Go. So instead of one really smart Joel Benj uh, Benjamin, you basically have this endless army of ignorant but good at learning students who play Go all the time. And just to put this in some context, the difference between the number of moves in chess and the number of moves uh, in Go is the, difference, the, is the difference between the number of atoms in our bodies and the number of atoms in the universe. So the achievement of machine learning really makes the achievement of earlier artificial intelligence seem very cute by comparison. <laughs> so what do I take away from this? It took giving computers the technology to learn at scale to make them capable of tackling really hard problems. And that should make us realize that the technology we need to be giving students to help them learn needs to be focused on helping them learn by doing, by experiencing, and by having agency and not facts. And VR enables exactly that, experiences, trying things, open-ended exploration, learning by doing. We need to put learners in the position to discover for themselves to organize facts into concepts and to turn misconceptions into metacognition. This is how students truly learn. So I think we all sit here in a really powerful moment. We as a creative community of like creative technologists who want to work on using technology to improve people's lives, we can actually push education forward and maybe hopefully transform how our kids learn. Thank you.